The next question is from, I'm going to go back to the MBT forum users, some of the ones that we didn't get to last, last time. So from Tony A on the MBT forum, as Thomas said in talks, when you get things at the intellectual level, it's like you may think something is true and may even argue the point, but when you get it, when you get it at the being level, you actually know something is true, which is a whole new deeper level of understanding. You talk something about this today, of the intuitive versus the intellectual. The question is, what actually happens to your free will awareness unit slash IULC when this being level knowledge is obtained? As an analogy, is it getting at the being level? Is like you write the knowledge to your hard drive where before looking at it intellectually was like on a cloud server? What changes as far as digital makeup to the free will awareness unit and IULC after knowledge becomes a known? Well, you're trying to push the metaphor down into detail where it doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. When you get down to the point of trying to say, you know, is it in the hard drive or is it in the cloud server? Um, or maybe we could make a whole bunch of new metaphors, you know, that uh, that would break it down that way. But I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I don't suggest that we go there like that because there's a there's a problem in breaking, making your metaphors too detailed, too specific. You know, meta metaphors have a have a kind of a, a general meaning. We understand what they mean, and if we break that down and try to get it into the more and more detail and more and more detail, it's kind of better just to use new metaphors or just if you have to go into that detail, but don't go into any more detail than is absolutely necessary. So we get something and we know it. Okay. Well, when we know it, when I get something and and I I feel like that's right. That's going to happen. I know that is something that's solid. All right. I get that, but I don't really make that a one. I may say it that way. I'm real confident about this, but it's really a point nine nine nine. you know, in my, in my thought process. It's not absolute. As soon as you start talking about absolutes, now you've gone from, from a, you know, an opinion into a belief. And at that point, you're going to start running into trouble. That just means I really, really strongly think that this is going to happen. But I know that there's a possibility that it won't. And I accept that possibility that it might be wrong. That, to me, is an important, there's an important point between the point 999 and the 1. I never get the 1. Almost never. You know, is this MBT theory, uh, you, know, the, you know, the way it is, is this a really great model of reality? Well, I think it's pretty good, but it's certainly not a one. It's not the, you know, most, you know, best or whatever. I would never say any of that. It's just a reality model. And as much as it's useful, it's good. When it ceases being useful, use something else that's better. You know, so you can't got to stay away from the from the certainties you have to learn to live life with a lot of uncertainty what i say be graceful you know with uncertainty or accept uncertainty with grace however that goes but anyway you have to live with uncertainty so information the difference between information that uh, comes through the intellect well that's usually things that you have that's usually the result of of Analysis. I've done analysis because of this and because of that and because of my experience, then I predict this. That's the way your intellect works. It does logic, it does analysis. And if your result is one of analysis, that's only as good as the assumptions that your analysis is based on, which is really usually where the problem is. The assumptions upon which your analysis are based, you may not even be aware of them, but usually there are assumptions there upon which your analysis is based, and often those assumptions are not true. So the analysis doesn't work out very well. So it's got that problem. 
because to make a logical deductive conclusion, you know, a logical deductive analysis requires a lot of information. There can't be any loopholes or any things that you're guessing at. There, everything has to be well known and very little in life is well known. So mostly our logic has to have assumptions, not facts at its root. And when it does, it's often not right. Now, the intuitive stuff that comes to you where you feel like it's right and you just get a knowing, you also have to keep that at a 0.99 or something. Don't make it a one. It can still be wrong. And if you get confident that you're always absolutely right is when it starts going wrong. As long as you realize that it might be wrong, but it's the best you have and you're going to work with it, then often it'll be right. Because one is acceptance, the other is arrogance. I'm right. I'm always right. It's going to be right. This always has to work. When you get to that, you've started to create your own problem. But again, this isn't an intellectual thing. It's a You have to do it from the being level. So being level knowledge isn't really a different type of knowing. It's all just consciousness. It's all information. But you have different levels of different levels of uh, credibility, if you will. It's a 0.5 or a 0.9 or a 0.99 or a 0.01, and you kind of have to let things fall on that range of of uh, of not knowing for sure. So when you start out and you know you've got some flaky assumptions, then you're probably at the 0.3, 0.4 range you know things don't work out don't give it a lot of credibility which is the way the intellect mostly is because it's based on assumptions when you get data directly from the lcs and you've got you've done it enough that you know that this feels right then it's maybe a 0.99 if you do intellectual stuff and it is actually deductive logic there are no assumptions it's only facts you're based on then that can be a 0.99 or maybe if it's that way, it's it's a it's a one, because it's just a logical process. But that almost never happens in real life. So now I wouldn't take those two kinds of knowing and try to make metaphors for them. One's in the cloud, and you know, one's on a hard drive. I just say we get knowledge and information through various sources. We can deduce it intellectually. We can get it. Uh, directly from the LCS, we can get it from each other, and we just have to take whatever we get and be wise enough to know the errors that might be in it. Wise enough to know that we have assumptions at the root of it, or we have beliefs at the root, which are just another word for assumptions, and therefore treat it accordingly. The problem is when we have those, those beliefs, we think they're facts, but they're really just beliefs. And then it, we get wrong answers. It confuses us. So it's not that there's different kinds of knowledge that come, or even that we take that knowledge and put it in different places like clouds or hard drives. It's all information. And we as consciousness have to sort and sift through that information as best we can. And with experience, we can get very good at knowing right information that comes to us intuitively but only with a lot of experience. And that experience doesn't necessarily bleed over into other things. It's just experience. Okay, Tom. <clears throat> in other words, um, don't get too bogged down in the details of the metaphors that sort of um, hold you back from... We, you can get all twisted up around metaphors, yes. I have sometimes, some time ago when somebody... Uh, you know, there's lots of people that say they have toes, theories of everything. And I've investigated those when somebody says, oh, yeah, here's a toe I read. And, and you'll get to someone and they have reality and they have it based in, you know, 37 levels of something or other. And it's got all this detail, all this metaphoric detail of lots and lots of levels and sub levels and so on. And it's like, well, that's just, is that all necessary? I mean, do we really need to break things down into that level of detail 
Is there value there? And for the most part, I find no value in it. I find that reality is really very simple. When you look at the big picture, keep it simple. It doesn't have to, you know, get into detail. So I resist urges to to create more detail. Like, what does the larger conscious system do all day while the, you know, while the uh, um, the free will awareness unit is off interacting? You know, what does it do? Twiddle its thumbs, play play solitaire on a, you know, on its own computer. Well, I just don't go there because that's not necessary. If you make up stuff to answer those kinds of questions, you start generating more detail than's valuable. So it's let that go. I don't know what it does all day while this free will free will awareness unit is working. It's yeah. not necessary. We just have various functions that have to be done in consciousness, and that's not necessarily the way consciousness is. It's a model of consciousness. And making more metaphors to give it more detail, I think, is generally more confusing than it is helpful. If you can keep it really, really simple, it's better. And it, I, I think it's actually more powerful if it's simple and elegant than it is if it's got lots and lots of detail. Yes, well, the, the point is to experience, not to get bogged down in charts and, and things like that. So that makes sense. The next question comes from Marcus from the MBT Forum. I learned from a yogic master that a transformational process, which consists of simply sitting alert with eyes open, meaning not reading, not thinking, pondering, or performing any action except the basics of eating and such for a few consecutive days. Then I watched a video of a Buddhist monk teaching a similar process, this consisting of just sitting doing nothing, which he describes as dropping any intention of controlling attention during it. I'd like to know if those are the same, and what are your thoughts on this type of meditation, and if you would recommend it, and why? Well, yeah, they're mostly the same. One of the things I've said often is that there is only one truth, but there's thousands of paths that will take you to that truth. So there's lots and lots of different ways that we can approach meditation. There's lots of different models we can use. There's lots of different ways of getting there, but it all boils down to just one truth. Okay. And whatever path we're on, it isn't that some paths are right paths and other paths are wrong paths. Each path is maybe suitable to a certain type of person. So some people go one path and other people take different paths. And that's good because we have lots of different types of people. So that we have lots of different types of paths is a good thing. So if you have a meditation and it's got a one, one name in a, in a yogi school and another name in a Buddhist school and another name in some other school, you may see that same sort of thing in 20 different, philosophical systems, but it's all more or less the same thing. Yes. What you describe is just being. Get it acquainted with yourself as a being. It's like saying hello to your being level is what that's all about. Letting your intellectual level go silent. Just getting acquainted with you as a being. And that exercise, just doing that, nothing more than that, just so that you can get into this state and hold it, just become acquainted with yourself at the being level, is a good exercise. Now, if that's the only thing you do, you know, when I say that's a good exercise, I don't mean that that is all you have to do to, you know, find wisdom. You know, you will have to do other things as well. But is that a tool? to use along the way? Yes, of course. And whether you do it in one of 20 ways isn't important. It's whatever works best for you. But that's a good initial starting point. Say hello to yourself at the being level. Just exist. Learn to let the intellect go. That's a very good thing to learn because when you are trying to do other things like connect with people and understand their issues, understand their feelings, 
or even if you're doing things like remote viewing, letting go of that intellect is essential. You can't do any of that without letting go of your intellect. So where do you start? Well, start by letting go of your intellect in a very systematic way and do it for long periods of time to where it's some state that you can kind of jump into when you want to, when you need it. Sure. So I'd say, yes, it's a, it's a profitable thing to do. And uh, uh, yes, they are pretty much the same thing. And when it comes to, you know, the different ways of approaching it, pick a way that suits you, but then take that way that suits you and custom fit it to you. Don't feel like you have to do it the, quote, proper, unquote, way, or it's not going to work well. Experiment with it. Again, life is experimental. Get to do it the way that you're taught or uh, until you master it. But once you master it, start creating your own format. Do it in your own way. With your own approach. Experiment, experiment, experiment. And you'll find that you can improve on anything that you've been taught. Even if you were taught by the highest, loftiest, you know, super master on the planet, you can improve it by making it more the way you think, using metaphors that resonate with you. You see, you can improve it. So make your own, you know, make your own uh, process that you go through. Play with it. Try different things. That may take you years. It's not that you try different things for a week and now you know what's best, and now you always do that. That's not good. You may do that, but then a few months later, try a lot of other things. Keep trying. Always be an experimenter. Don't look for the final right thing. That's an illusion. Always experiment. Always be willing to do it differently, to try different things as they come to you, as you get little nudges and say, well, what if, what if you didn't do that? I know they tell you that that's necessary and you have to do that. But what if you didn't do it? What difference would it make? Do the experiment. Find out. They might be right. It might be necessary. Or it might not. You see? So take charge. Find out. So yes and yes. Good experience. Good thing to do. But it's not the end thing. It's not do this and that's all you need to grow up. That's not all you need to grow up. It is a tool on the process of growing up. And you can make as much of that tool or as little of it as you want. And is that particular tool necessary? No. You could skip that altogether and do something else. And that would work. Remember, thousands and thousands of paths. And each one will take you to where you need to go as long as you're persistent and as long as you work at it from the being level and as long as you experiment. All right. Thank you, Tom. Another question from the MBT forum user that we have not yet gotten to. How, as this is a very, um, these are very earnest questions on the accessibility of data from the database. How long does the database maintain the person's data? Is Abraham Lincoln's data accessible? If there was a good reason to access it, to access it. Julius Caesar, how about some unknown subway token collector who died in 1956? Is it a good use of resources to maintain data on every conscious being that ever lived? How about the life review you talk about? MBT suggests when the avatar dies, the partition is removed, the part of the IU IUOC is now in a different reality frame, and memories of that life that just ended fade like a dream. So when review time comes, where is the information where we are reviewing coming from? The database also, and that's that's assuming that you do get a review time. I'm guessing. Okay, I can answer all of that. the The data is collected based on probable usefulness. Not every pixel of every scene is collected. This is a larger consciousness system. The system is aware. The system itself is conscious. Okay, so it can make judgments. It can make assessments. 
based on its experience in running this virtual reality. So it collects what it thinks will be useful, might be useful, could be useful. So if it's, you know, and then it's got some, some threshold where it says, well, if the probability of usefulness is less than 0 0.001, we won't collect it, that sort of thing. Okay, so it may have some sort of threshold. Now, that's just a way of, that's just a metaphor, the way I'm putting it into words so that you understand. So there's some point at which it doesn't collect information. Okay, and it keeps that information just as long as there is some probability of it being useful, that somebody will want to use it, that it'll be needed, that somebody can learn something from it. And maybe if the probability that this information will ever be useful to anybody is less than 0 0.00001, then we're going to delete it. Another threshold for deletion. Okay, so it doesn't save everything. It doesn't record everything, but it records everything that it thinks might be useful. And if you wanted to go look at Abraham Lincoln, I suspect that you would find all of the stuff that was important about Abraham Lincoln still there because that is still information that's useful. But whether or not he, you know, whether or not he rolled over on his left side or his right side, you know, on a certain day, you know, at a certain point at three o'clock in the morning, isn't likely to be there. And if you ask the system for that, it wouldn't say, oh, well, we didn't take that because we didn't think it was important, or, well, we deleted that because we didn't think it was important. The answer will become what probably may have been there. So if you say, I want to know if he rolled to his left side or his right side at 3 a.m. on such and such a day, then it'll give you maybe what was probable, what's likely because it didn't necessarily record that because it wasn't important, didn't meet the criteria. So if you want to know what Joe Schmo, who was a token collector in the subway, you know, a hundred years ago, what he ate for lunch on July 4th, you know, 1700 and you know, whatever, you know, if, if that's what you want to know, the system will maybe give you something that he could have eaten for lunch. That was possible or probable that somebody from that era, that time in that position, would have eaten for lunch. If those are the kind of questions you're asking, you'll get something back. But it doesn't necessarily tell you this is something that's probable or this is exactly what that toll conductor you know, ate for lunch on that particular day. I suspect that's stuff that never gets collected because it's just not important, particularly if it's that old. So the system doesn't hold everything forever and it doesn't collect everything. But it is a aware consciousness it has its own analysis that it makes of what is important and what's not and it bases that analysis on the last you know whatever many thousands of years that it's been running this reality millions of years billions of years really what five and a half billion years or something that this reality has been run but right now there's more people asking questions than there was a uh you know, maybe uh, 100,000 years ago, because there's a whole lot more people now than there was 100,000 years ago. So the system has to, you know, deal with this in a way that seems to be appropriate. But no, it's not just a machine that records everything or a machine that never deletes anything. You have to think of this as a, an aware, conscious, system capable of doing its own analysis and doing things in an efficient way as far as efficiency i mean in a in a computer science context doing things in an efficient way you see that's the probability that the scientists got into when they were desperately trying to keep a physical reality but just but yet um admit that you know people had precognitive dreams and that people have uh, deja vu and that people have connection you know have things that happen they can 
you know, they can remote view and do other things. They know these things are fact, but they can't support any of that from a materialistic viewpoint. So they finally found a way that they could support that from a materialistic viewpoint, and it's become somewhat popular, and that is the many worlds theory. You see? So they have many worlds that when you uh, do whatever you do, you split off another whole reality where that was done and the one where you didn't do it goes on. Therefore, there is a physical reality where every possible thing has been done and not done. See, where all the possibilities have worked out in some physical reality someplace. You see, there it's all physical. And when you when you have a, a, a precognitive dream, you're just getting into a different uh, uh, reality frame where that dream happened that way. So now you shift to a reality frame where that's true. Ah, now you're, there's your precognitive dream. It's just people hop around between these these uh, all these reality frames. Well, the problem with that is that because their reality is just a machine, then they ha have no way of that machine saying, well, I'm only going to keep track of significant changes because that what's significant, that requires an awareness. That requires a consciousness to make a judgment about what's going to be significant and what's not. Well, if you have a machine because you're trying to be a materialist and uh, and then you're stuck with it has to be every change. Now, when a single electron somewhere in the universe goes from a spin up to a spin down, you need a whole new universe. You see, and it gets really ridiculous. At that point, the number of independent universes you have for every possible physical change in the universe makes the whole theory laughable. It doesn't work anymore. It's a ridiculous idea. Because that, that universe that just had one electron flip, if there's any electron flip within that universe, it has to make another one. And as you see, this is a geometrically growing thing that becomes ridiculous in, its, in, its, in the breadth and depth of, of requirement for physical universes. So the whole thing gets silly because they can't say that there's something there that can judge whether it's significant enough to spawn off another universe. That would require consciousness. And in a, in a materialistic uh, universe, there is no consciousness. There's only physical process. You see? So that's why they, the many worlds thing gets stuck in, in ridiculous amounts of, of physical universes. So in the question you asked, the answer is it's not that everything has to be recorded and that everything has to be retained forever. It's that it's an aware system that retains what maintains good computer science efficiency. No more, no less. Thank you, Tom. The next question is also from the MBT forum on one of our earlier questions submitted. Um, the first one you've talked about before is about the IUOC checking out before a violent death or incident. The LCS playing the part of an avatar for a while during times of a trauma or abuse in childhood and such. How does the LCS choose when to take over? I know of people who remember some horrific things. So what is the cutoff point, so to speak, when the LCS takes over? Or does it depend on the IUOC? Some IUOCs being able to to bear more than others, perhaps. Well, Let's it's the. Oh, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Donna, no, but no, okay. it's the go same ahead. answer as to the last question. The IUOC is not a machine. It is a consciousness. It's aware. It thinks. It has feeling. It's like us, just better and you know less uh, less fear and ego it's an individual okay so it makes assessments it looks at probability what's the likelihood that that damage is going to occur that will be problematical well when it comes to that conclusion that the probability that this is going to be beyond the person's ability to deal with it and it's going to cause a lot of damage to that entity, that's when it decides to step in. 
or it may decide that, well, it's 50-50. Maybe the entity can deal with it and maybe they can't. So maybe I'll just keep a real close watch on that. And if it looks like it's gone negative, I'll jump in and do something then. It can do whatever it wants. Again, it makes its choices based on its assessment of the probabilities. This is a probabilistic virtual reality. It's everything's based on probability here. All of it is calculated based on probability. That's the nature of our universe. It's the nature of our reality. The nature of consciousness, too. <clears throat> so the system looks at all the all the actors, everything that's in play, all the ba past history of that entity and all maybe the other past lives they had. It's got all this information. And from that information, it comes up with what its best choice is. The choice may be to monitor and, and relook at it later. The choice may be to jump in right now or to wait or there's no need to jump in. But it looks at the probability of of lowering entropy in the long run. Okay, that's its key. So if it looks at this and says, well, in the long run, that's likely to raise the entropy. And, you know, it's, it's going to be a very negative thing. And it may say, well, you know, sometimes negative things are just a result of, our, of what's going on. You know, like the results of, uh, you know, wars and things. Well, we learn from wars. They serve as good, bad examples. So that sort of thing, it's not going to jump in. It's going to let us stew in our own joy, juice and have to suffer the consequences of our own choices. But when it's not your choice, when you're only five years old and somebody's torturing you, then there's not really much of a choice there. You just have a possibility of damaging an entity so that their next, their next uh, lifetimes are going to be uh, biased by that damage. It's going to hurt. So at that point, you decide to jump in. It's not about suffering the consequences of our own decisions. You see, it's a different kind of animal. So it looks at all the various situations, decides what's good for the overall evolution and for the individual, because what's good for the individual is good for the overall evolution. Those two things, they're independent, but they're highly correlated. And then it decides what it's going to do, when it's going to do it, when it's going to stop doing it, and to what extent its, you know, its uh, uh, intrusion into this reality is warranted. So it's really the same answer, and all, and it's just the system does what it thinks best based on trying to optimize long-term entropy decrease whatever that is. Okay. Um, the question went on to ask, do animals check out also during violent deaths and such? Yes. That, uh, particular, that's good because that has a particular significance to what is going on in Australia now. A half a billion animals have died in the fires in Australia. Yes, it works the same way. Animals are conscious. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, they're not that much different than us. They're just different avatars. They have consciousness. Their consciousness is not the same as ours. It's very similar in the way it works. The mechanics are all the same. All its attributes are just the same, but there's differences in capacity and in capability. Okay, so a dog is conscious just like a person's conscious. And the conscious works exactly the same way, but it comes with different capacities and different abilities. Okay. Same with orcas and, and dolphins and creatures that have much bigger brains than we do. You know, you'd think maybe that gives them a, a larger decision space because there's more things that they can do here. Well, different capacities, different qualities. So, yeah, they work exactly the same way, even for a bug. Matter of fact, you can see that if you've ever noticed, and I noticed this once when I was lying in a bed, and above me was a ceiling light that had a um, you know one of these globe shades that's on the bottom of it. So there's a light bulb in here, and then there's a shade up to the ceiling. And you notice when you look at those things, there's almost always a couple of dead bugs in them, you know. You clean them out every once in a while, but you look up, and there's be a couple of little black spots inside that inside that sh that uh, that light uh, 
shade and, and uh, they get dead bugs in them. And I one time was lying there looking at that light shade and a, dug, a dead bug dropped in it just then. And the bug went over to the side of the globe, which was kind of straight up on the edges. It was rolled up like this. And it got to the steep part and it couldn't get out. So it's just sitting there, you know, running its little legs and feet as fast as it could. But it just couldn't get out. It was stuck. It couldn't walk out of the glass bowl because the glass was too slippery. And it didn't have the kind of feet like a fly that can stick on, on glass. So it was just stuck there. And I watched it. And I watched it. Came back and looked at it again. I was curious about what it would do. having gotten stuck in a situation where it couldn't retrieve itself. And I noticed that within a very short period of time, it died. It didn't die because it starved to death. It didn't die because it didn't have any water. It was way too short. That let me know that it died because there was no hope. It died because it was going to die. So it just terminated rather than go through the starving or or uh, thirsting to death, which would have been a long, slow process. So it just quit. So yes, even bugs do that. If there is a situation where there's nothing but, but negative experience after that, then there's no point. You can just stop and go have another lifetime. There's no point in just persisting when they're when the probability of success is zero. So it's the same for somebody whose parachute doesn't open. You know, they're at 10,000 feet and they leap out of a plane and a parachute doesn't open. Then it's the same sort of thing. There's no point for them to experience the splat. They That would be a kind of a horrific end. So mostly at that point, they just find themselves out of body. And then they find themselves in the in the transition reality. And then they find themselves eventually going back into another incarnation. They don't have to experience the the awfulness of that. I think that's a very uh, comforting thought on, uh, on a lot of levels there. He does have another part to his question that has to do with past lives and dreaming of your future spouse or people you meet later on in life, uh, meeting people you've never met and feeling extremely drawn to each other, then both having memories of a past life together, the same memories. Uh, does the LCS only allow this if the IULCs have some unfinished business uh, like they were supposed to meet and help each other lower entropy in this lifetime? No, it's not so much keyed on the unfinished business. It can be but that would be more rare. More typically, it happens because both people are ready for it to happen. In other words, it's part of the learning process that you have this experience where you are drawn to somebody and then you have this conversation and you find out you know, things that uh, you both you know, connect with things. Well, all of that becomes verification of the nature of your reality. It becomes part of the truth of your of your own experience. Your reality grows a little bigger because it encompasses a little more than just what the physical reality is. So when people are ready, they have these experiences. So more often it's the case that the system nudges those things together in such a way is they can both go, oh wow, look. You know, and they can have this 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 experience that is beyond physical experience, and that's part of their growing. So it's typically it's a growing thing, and it happens to people who are ready for it to happen, for the most part. Now it's possible that it can happen uh, because of the message that is needs to be, you know, given because there's something uh, particularly a, a thing to learn or a thing to. Uh, you know, a message to get across because of the content of it. But usually it's not the content of it that's what's important. It's just that it happens is important. So the system isn't delivering specific content that's supposed to be terribly important as it is delivering an experience to people who are ready for it. 
the content itself often turns out to be not particularly important. It's just important because of the verification it delivers of things um, being greater than just the physical. All right, Tom, we have a few moments left. We'll do one more question, also from the MBT forum. You are always, and this is on creating beliefs by answering fireside chat questions. You're always telling us of the importance of not having beliefs, but doesn't every answer you give to a question just end up as, as a belief in the person asking the question? Does belief play an important role here? <laughs> no. Been listening to enough fireside no, he hasn't listened to enough fireside <laughs> chats. We just went over this already today. That's the point. No, I don't want anybody to believe these things, but I want them to use them if it helps them structure and find meaning in their own experience. If it helps them understand reality in a way that's useful to them, then they can use it, but certainly don't believe it. Use what's useful to you, but don't believe any of it. No. And I keep telling people that don't put yourself into a situation where you have to believe, you feel like you have to believe or disbelieve something. Oh, there's some new information. Should I believe it or disbelieve it? That's leaving out that huge place in the middle of living gracefully with uncertainty where you don't know whether it's right or wrong. And you have somewhere between, you know, 0 0.0001 and 0.9999 that you think it might be true or might be false. That's where most things should be in your life. Very seldom should you get to a point where you, where you get a one or a zero. I believe it or I don't believe it. Those are the ones and the zeros. You shouldn't get there very often. So I'm hoping I'm not generating a lot of belief. I certainly try not to. I, I keep telling people, don't believe what I tell you. Use it if it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, don't use it. Throw it away. But if it helps you understand your reality and it helps you understand your growth and it helps you get rid of fear and makes your life better, if you can find happiness with it, then use it. And your own experience will tell you whether to make that a point zero zero one or a point nine nine nine. Your experience has to move that. When you first hear the things I say, you may say, well, that's kind of outrageous and far out there. I'll give that a point zero zero one. But if you're open minded, you'll work with it. And perhaps just perhaps eventually your own experience will move that up to a point nine 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 because your personal experience verifies it. But if not, well, throw it away. If it does, then use it. But you have to verify by your personal experience. So. No, I hope I'm not generating belief, but I understand that there are a lot of people who feel obligated to either believe or not believe every piece of information they get. And for those people, I guess they do, they do, you know, either one, a belief or a disbelief is both a belief, right? When you say, I don't believe that, that's a, that's a belief too. I do believe that, you know, either one is, is you've come to a conclusion without any facts. That's called a belief. Whether you conclude it's false or conclude it's true. Conclusion based on assumptions is a belief. And almost all of your analysis is based on assumptions. Go ahead, I'm Donna. Beliefs and not beliefs are kind of like a baggage, really. You're just collecting stuff instead exactly. of experiencing stuff and testing stuff. Yes. That way. You don't have to think. When something yes. comes up, you just look in your bags of belief and see what your answer should be. And you pull out that answer, and there it is. You see, no thinking, no thinking required. You can go through life and never have to think a single thought. All you have to do is check your beliefs and say, well, yep, this and that, and no, not this, because everything that's in consonance with your beliefs is a yes, and everything that isn't is, is a no, and you don't need a brain or consciousness or anything else. You know, all you're, you've reduced yourself to a very simple computer, not even a very smart computer. That's, that's not a good way to, to grow up. Yes, it's the experiencing and things. Well, thank you, Tom. And we're going to end here just a few minutes early. Um, and 
continue on next time with any question that we've left out. And we hope to see um, more of you, those of you that submitted questions that didn't get answered today. Hope to see you back. Take care, yeah, everyone. Nope. And all of our thoughts go out to those people in Australia and those of you um, suffering with the effects of everything that's going on in the world. Just hang in there. If you have anything to say, Tom, maybe. Yeah, yeah. well, Donna, Donna, I do have something to say, but not about that. Okay. Uh, we've got four minutes left. And okay. uh, as long as we have four minutes left, let me point out that this is the 61st Fireside Chat. Uh, Oliver started this many, many years ago. We've been chugging through one a month, pretty much, with a few exceptions. This is the 61st of these. And I wanted to take the opportunity to thank Oliver and to thank Justin, who does all the editing and puts them up on the screen, to say thank you, guys, 61 of these things. I know that represents hundreds and hundreds of hours of yours that have been dedicated and donated to this, and I really appreciate it. And for all of you out there who look at these and get something out of them, there's a way that you can help them do this, and that is go to Oliver's site or hopefully just in sight too, and there's a contribute button there for all the work that they do. Well, this is time and money. Oliver runs this server out of his own pocket. You know, the server that serves this thing isn't for free. It's not a free server. Oliver makes this happen because he takes money out of his pocket to do it. So go to Oliver's site and, and uh, contribute a little bit to help pay to bring this about. And Justin doesn't have to pay for a site, but he puts in a huge amount of time and uh, you know, his, his wife uh, grants him that time and his children grant him that time. He could be doing things more fun than editing video, but he does it anyway because he wants to be a part of the solution. So if you don't have a, if you don't have a donation bu button, Justin, you ought to get one and you ought to put it on your site. And uh, you guys ought to go tell Justin that you appreciate all the hundreds of hours he puts into this without any pay <laughs> other than the fact that he wants to do it so uh, we still have two minutes left so I'll, I'll let anybody else say anything they they want but i wanted to get that out because we've gone into 61 that's quite a there's a lot of these and they help people every time we put one out there's you know hundreds of comments on it that uh, say thank you i really learned a lot from that so support it all of you readers or listeners out there a lot of people look forward to the fireside chats. Yes, thank you, Oliver and Justin. And jump in there and show your appreciation if you do get a lot out of this. Thank you all. See you next time.